Christianity has had one of the most enduring and tumultuous relationships with magic in world religions. On the one hand, the official word is that the practice is completely banned. As I've mentioned in a previous episode, Christianity has long held that magic is essentially the work of demons, meant to ensnare and destroy the soul of its practitioners. And indeed, we can find repeated bans on magic and magical practice as early as the New Testament, through the Apostolic Fathers, into the Middle Ages, and beyond. Of course, banning a practice only reveals that it was, well, practiced, and often psychologically the effect is actually counterintuitive. By banning something, we actually make it more enticing. There can be no doubt, from a historical point of view, that magic has flourished in all aspects of Christendom, in all periods of that religion, and in all iterations of that faith. Indeed, most magical practices that have survived into modern occultism are simply unimaginable without the backdrop of Christianity, although I think most modern occultists and most Christians would not want to admit that that's true. From Simon Magus to Dr. John Dee's conversations with angels, one could very much argue that Christianity has been both the greatest foe and the greatest ally to the development of magical theory and practice in the Western world. In this episode of Esoterica, we're going to explore some of the earliest Christian, yes, Christian forms of magic to be found in the ancient world, from amulets to magical spells to a whole range of incantation, including curses. As we'll see, magic was alive and well in early Christianity. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion. This episode is somewhat of a follow-up to the episode I made on the Greek magical papyri. If you haven't seen the episode yet, you may want to pause here and check that one out first. Much of this episode is going to take for granted a lot of the background information that we discussed in that video. So if you want to check that out, there's a link in the card above. Check that one out first and come back to this one to get a more full understanding of the kind of world that produced the kind of Christian magic we'll be discussing at length in this episode. Though, just to review a few things before we get started. A great deal of the knowledge we have about magic from the early common era is actually from Egypt, and there are a couple reasons for this. The first is that Egypt had a highly developed magical tradition reaching all the way back into the Pharaonic period. This indigenous form of Egyptian magic, or Heka, has a very long history and a wide range of magical applications, from medical magic to execration magic, this is magic which wards off evil, to the animation of statues by divine gods, to the resurrection powers that are found in the Egyptian mythology around the afterlife. I'm planning on doing an episode specifically on Egyptian magic or Heka at some point in the near future, so if you're really interested in that form of magic, stay tuned. A second reason for the endurance of so much written magical material from this period, and just written material in general, is that the medium used for writing in ancient Egypt, papyrus, is incredibly durable. As you probably know, papyrus is made from a reed which is stripped, and those strips are laid against one another. The juices from the papyrus reed itself act as a kind of glue, which bind those strips together into an incredibly durable material. I have a piece of papyrus here, and it's amazing how well you can see how well this material is very, very strong in terms of its, uh, its non-terrability and its durability. In fact, papyrus is so durable that one can even make baskets from the reeds themselves. And the fact that one can make baskets, weight-bearing baskets, and these, some of these baskets have survived for thousands of years, show the incredible strength of the papyrus plant. Finally, the hot and dry climate of Egypt greatly increases the durability of texts written on things like papyrus, paper, and parchment. In fact, in 2013, French archaeologists discovered a papyrus sheet in a cave describing the transport of stones. These stones were probably used for the Great Pyramid at Giza being built under the administration of Pharaoh Khufu. That text, the Diary of Merer, is over 4,500 years old and is still legible to this very day. What's really incredible when you think about that is that Jesus of Nazareth is closer to us in time than he was to the composition of that text, which only shows just how durable papyrus in this environment is. <laughs> 
Of course, another reason why we'll discover early Christian magic primarily in Egypt is the very long relationship Christianity has had with that region. This relationship goes all the way back to the Gospel of Matthew, in which Jesus and his family are said to take in refuge during the massacre of the innocents allegedly perpetuated by Herod. And it's said that Mark himself was the person who introduced Christianity into Egypt sometime right after the death of Jesus. Further, monastic life is said to have developed in ancient Egypt under people like St. Anthony. And further, many of the greatest early theologians of Christianity actually emerged in Egypt. This would include people like Clement, Origen, Athanasius, and of course, Arius. Another factor that may explain the rise of ancient Christian magic in Egypt is that ancient Christianity lived among several other religions and philosophies in that region at that time. Here we think, for instance, to Judaism, whose presence in Egypt actually predates Christianity by centuries. We have evidence of both Jewish temples operating in Alexandria, but also a Jewish presence dating all the way back to the Persian period on the Elephantine Island. This would also include the various religious and philosophical schools like Hermetism, Gnosticism, along with the various mystical and straightforwardly philosophical schools. We shouldn't forget this was also the land of Philo of Alexandria, along with people like Plotinus, the founder of Neoplatonism. And of course, we have to think of all those religions, philosophies, and mysticisms as being set against the backdrop of the indigenous religion of Egypt, which stretches back from millennia. Not to mention many religious newcomers to the region as well. This would include things like the cult of Serapis, the dualistic religion of Manichaeism, and many, many more. As you can see, Egyptian life was incredibly pluralistic and was marked by a high degree of cultural, religious, and magical syncretism. That is to say, Egypt, in some sense, was an ancient melting pot. Of course, before turning to talk about specifically Christian magic, we should note that Christianity had a very difficult relationship from its earliest beginnings. Indeed, part of this problem has to do with the fact that Christianity was a new religion, and the idea that a religion was new was basically the idea that it wasn't true in the Roman imagination. New and religion simply made very little sense in the Roman mind. Even Judaism, a religion that the Romans basically held in contempt for its single invisible God worshipped only in one temple in Jerusalem, still at some level respected Judaism for its great antiquity. Though this courtesy would not be extended to Christianity. Its leader, Jesus of Nazareth, had basically been executed in the most humiliating way for the most terrible of crimes, probably something like treason, and not just executed by crucifixion, but executed last week. The idea that an executed criminal could become a god was something that the Romans just found to be very, very unusual, perhaps even disgusting. So we have to understand that Christianity from its very early period had an uphill battle for legitimacy. Now, while Christianity did have this PR problem, the fact that it was a new religion, there's an interesting counterbalance to this in the ancient world. And that counterbalance has to do with the fact that many people, in fact, believed Jesus did do the miracles ascribed to him. In fact, many early Christians were thought to actually have magical or miraculous powers. Of course, in both Roman and in Jewish eyes at the time, Jesus and his followers didn't have these powers because of Jesus being the Son of God and therefore Christianity being a legitimate religion. So part of the debate early on around Christianity wasn't whether Jesus and his followers had supernatural powers. Even someone who was a harsh opponent of Christianity like Celsus basically admitted that they did. The question is where those powers came from, and in many people's eyes, those powers originated either in magic or in demonic power. So as you can see, Christianity is going to have a really difficult time early on with magic, because on the one hand, it needs to argue that its miracles are the result of a legitimate relationship with the divine and not the workings of sorcery or magic. And so you can see part of what Christianity is going to have to do very early on is distance itself in a very strong way from magical practices. This whole quest to distance itself from magic but also claim historical legitimacy led Christianity into some rather interesting results. For instance, one of the early tactics used by some early Christians was to claim that ancient pagan philosophers actually foretold the coming of Jesus. In fact, one of the ancient pagan philosophers, or maguses, that early Christians claimed foretold the coming of Christianity was in fact Hermes Trismegistus. Now, this is ironic, of course, because Hermes Trismegistus is primarily linked in the ancient imagination with things like astrology, alchemy, and, well, magic. <laughs> 
This quest for legitimacy and this desire to distance itself from magic led early Christianity to, again, to somewhat strange bedfellows. Here again we have someone like Lactantius arguing that none other than Hermes Trismegistus is a kind of prefiguring of Christianity. Again, linking Christianity, ironically, with alchemy, astrology, and magic. Of course, that irony wasn't lost on all early Christians. St. Augustine, for instance, really didn't like the idea of linking Hermes Trismegistus with early Christianity, probably because of the associations with Hermes Trismegistus and these various kinds of occult practices. Of course, it's also going to be St. Augustine who's going to primarily develop the anti-magic attitudes that Christianity is going to hold from the late classical period into the medieval period and beyond. However, that didn't stop ancient Christians from happily going about practicing magic. So before turning to look at some of the magical texts that have survived from the early Christian period, I know that there are going to be some people out there that are going to say something like, well, real Christianity doesn't practice magic. Christianity bans magic, and therefore anything that was done in the name of magic was never actually Christian, and therefore Christian magic simply can't exist. This is a bit of a version of what is called the true Scotsman's argument. The idea that, for instance, real Christians would never engage in the Crusades, and therefore the violence perpetuated by the Crusaders wasn't Christian, or that the Ku Klux Klan isn't Christian because real Christianity isn't racist. Well, the reality is that we can make a distinction between what Christianity officially says and what actual Christians do. In this case, we can make a distinction between what elite Christian theologians and Christian lawyers, as they were developing Christianity, articulated in terms of what Christians should and shouldn't do. However, that doesn't have a lot of impact, and necessarily, upon what average Christians did in Alexandria in ancient Egypt. Any conception of true Christianity, or true Judaism, or true paganism for that matter, is really just an abstract idea that primarily exists in the minds of practitioners and theologians. It doesn't really so much exist on the ground. Real people do all kinds of, well, weird things that aren't exactly orthodox, and aren't exactly the exact representation of how religion should be practiced in the mind of elite theorists. So from the point of view of scholarship alone, I'm actually interested in both versions of Christianity, both the elite version of Christianity that exists in the minds of theologians and lawyers, but I'm also really interested in the average Christianity that was practiced on the streets of the ancient world. And what we'll find is that those two things often don't meet up, and the average Christian practicing on the street may have been somewhat different and may have even been condemned at some level by the kind of high-level theoreticians operating in the monasteries or in the churches. That the average Christian on the street may have been chastised or even condemned by the monks, priests, and theologians operating at the high level of Christian orthodoxy doesn't mean that the average Christian on the street was any less of a Christian. In fact, by studying these magical documents, I think we get a new light on how Christianity was actually practiced among common people in the ancient world. And that's very important because we need a very full picture of just what Christianity was, not just the idea of what pure, rarefied Christianity was in the minds of elite scholarship. That Christians were practicing magic is worthy of study alone, whether they were heretics or normies or whatever. The fact that they were engaging in this process is worth studying because we learn something about the diversity and the depth by which Christianity was operating, both from the very high level of the theologians all the way to the street level, perhaps, of magical practice in the ancient world. Not that the high level folks didn't do magic too, but we learn a lot about how Christianity was being practiced in reality in the ancient world. So studying Christian magic is a core and essential aspect of gaining a real insight into what early Christianity was in fact like. As I mentioned earlier, most of the magical texts that we have that survive from ancient Egypt are primarily preserved in two languages. They're preserved in either Greek or Coptic, Coptic being the final version of the ancient Egyptian language being written out in Greek letters. Specifically, we can divide ancient Christian magic in this period into either Coptic or Greek texts, and then we can further subdivide them into the various spell types. That is to say, we can look at healing spells, protective spells, erotic magic or love magic, cursing, and then a kind of miscellaneous grab bag of various magical spells that have been recovered from this ancient period. What typically separates these spells from the other spells collected in the vast collection of the Greek magical papyri is that these are almost always overtly Christian, either in symbolism, in language, 
are by virtue of the fact that we can be fairly confident that the practitioners of these magic were specifically Christian. Of course, like many magical texts of this period, even the specifically Christian spells often bear some degree of syncretism. That is to say, the magical practices actually mix Jewish, pagan, and Christian elements together. Although here, I want to focus really on the spells that are very explicitly Christian in character to give you an idea about what those spells and what early Christian magic looked like. So what I want to do now is turn and look at a couple of spells from each one of these categories to get a better sense of what ancient Christian magic looked like. Of course, I'm only covering a very small percentage of the spells, over 150 spells, collected by Meyer and Smith in their edition. So if you want to deep dive into early Christian magic, you'll have to pick that text up. I'll be talking a little bit about the text at the end of the video, as usual. So our first spell is actually a healing spell found at Oxyrhynchus. It's actually Moxyrhynchus 1077, written in Greek. Uh, Oxyrhynchus, as you may know, is a pretty famous trash heap. Uh, what's really great about trash heaps in history is that trash heaps tell us, well, a ton about the actual lived conditions of people in the ancient world. So archaeologists absolutely love trash. So in this trash heap have been found enormous amounts of text, ranging from uh, receipts to even early fragments of gospels. So the trash heap at Oxyrhynchus has just yielded a treasure trove of ancient manuscripts. And here we have an interesting spell using the Gospel of Matthew, text from the Gospel of Matthew, as a way of healing someone of some kind of illness. Of course, we should always consider the character of literacy in the ancient world. We're talking about a population where at most 25% of the population was literate, and so writing had a long association with magic. In fact, in ancient Egypt, Toth, the god of writing, is also a god of magic. So unsurprisingly, a text like the Gospel of Matthew, a text already thought to have somewhat supernatural power as having revealed the truth of Christianity, it's unsurprising that a text like the Gospels are also going to be used for magical healing purposes as well. What's also important about this spell is that the Gospel of Matthew is not just laid out, but laid out in cross-shaped patterns. Of course, the cross is the quintessential image in Christianity of the power over death, the power over sickness. It's the execution of Jesus on the cross that basically defeats death in the Christian mythology. So the fact that we have the Gospel of Matthew laid out in a cross-shaped pattern only further gives this amulet or this magical text further supernatural power. Finally, we also have a figure here at the center. It's not clear who this figure is, and as you can see, this text is quite worn. It's very likely this figure in the center is Jesus himself. So we have these cross-shaped patterns of the Gospel of Matthew, in which Jesus is healing people in that pericope, themselves shaped in cross-shaped patterns, and then Jesus placed at the center. You can also tell that this document was probably folded up and probably carried by the person who sought healing by it. So this amulet is fascinating because it uses a section from the Gospel of Matthew along with the cross-shaped configuration of the words, along with an image of Jesus, all to probably affect a kind of magical healing of the person that carried this amulet. Our next magical spell actually comes from PGM4. This is the great collection of magical documents held now in Paris. And it's interesting because it is written both in Greek and in Coptic, and it dates from about the fourth century. This magical spell is actually a kind of exorcism magic, which have been very popular in the ancient Greek world. As you probably know, exorcism was very intimately associated with Christianity and with Jesus in the ancient world. In fact, exorcism is one of the main miracles accomplished by Jesus in the Gospels. So we can see here the Christian elements are quite clear. We have the invocation of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Although it's interesting here that in the exorcism spell itself, we have the use of olive branches. Now, the use of olive branches is found all throughout ancient magic, and it has a wide variety of implications, specifically the implication and the symbolic power of victory. Of course, you'll remember in the Olympic Games, the olive branch is used as a sign of success in those games. So the use of olive branches in ancient magic was somewhat ubiquitous in this context. In fact, we see olive branches being used for protective diadems, for various kinds of chains, for instance, to bind demons, as we see in this spell, but also as a scourge, which we also see in this spell, where a bundle of olive branches are actually used as a kind of whip to drive the demons away. Further, this spell is also interesting because it uses a kind of post-exorcism amulet, 
to prevent demons from repossessing the person that has been liberated from this demonic possession. Um, the use of post-possession amulets actually dates back all the way to the ancient Near East, and we see something like the idea of post-possession magic being used all the way into contemporary exorcisms as well. What's perhaps interesting about this later aspect of the exorcism spell is that this later section may be earlier and may reflect a kind of syncretism with the indigenous religion of ancient Egypt and the Christian religion. Here in this later section of the incantation, the section of the amulet being written on metal, is actually gods like Bes and Horus. Of course, Bes and Horus were powerful Egyptian deities, and we see this repetition of these magical words over and over again. You'll see P-H-O-R being repeated in Coptic over and over. That P sound is actually the definite article in Coptic, and so it's probably some repetition of the Horus over and over and over again in various kinds of permutations in order in some sense to drive the demons away by the power of, it seems, Horus and Bess. So again, a really interesting syncretistic exorcism spell, which both uses Christian imagery and Christian language and Christian invocation, but at the same time is actually using Egyptian deities as a form of amulet to keep the demon from repossessing. So we use Christianity to get rid of the demon, but we use uh, Egyptian religion to keep the demon from getting back into that person. So again, a fascinating spell that shows the lines between Christianity and Egyptian religion aren't always clear in the ancient world. Another spell here we can take a look at is a protective spell composed in Greek sometime between the 5th and the 7th centuries. This spell is interesting because it uses both language from the Lord's Prayer, obviously a very important prayer in the history of Christianity, but it also mentions something called the Exorcism of Solomon. Solomon, of course, is very important in the history of control over demons. Certainly by this time period and before and all the way into modern occultism, Solomon is associated with his power to control, manipulate, dispel, and get demons to kind of do what you want. So Solomon is going to be instrumental in some ways in the history and development of magic. And we can see the development of that magical idea of Solomon controlling demons reaching all the way back here into early Christian magic. It's also worth noting here that toward the end of this exorcistic incantation, we also have language that's very evocative of Psalm 91. Psalm 91 is important in the history of exorcism, and we actually see it used all the way back from the Dead Sea Scrolls, in which some version of it was actually used for something like exorcistic rituals in the Jewish context and the Dead Sea Scrolls, all the way through exorcisms, all the way into now, really. Um, exorcistic spells and exorcistic incantations in both the Jewish and Christian context still use Psalm 91 as a kind of powerful mechanism for expelling demons. And of course, it's interesting to note that reaching all the way back to the 5th or 7th centuries of the Common Era, we have the exact same psalm being used for the exact same purpose, exorcism. So again, we can see an enormous amount of continuity in this early Christian magic, reaching all the way back to the Judaism of the Dead Sea Scrolls, through the early Christian magic of the Egyptian period, all the way into modern and contemporary exorcistic procedures that still use this psalm. So an incredible tradition here preserved in this early piece of Christian exorcistic magic. So here we have another healing and protection spell written in Coptic from around the 10th century. The spell has a lot of interesting characteristics, one of which is we actually have the name of the person who wishes to be healed in this spell, a certain Kirahu, the daughter of so-and-so. It's often worth noting that in many of these healing spells, the person is often identified matrilineally rather than patrilineally. Typically, a person will be known in the ancient world as so-and-so, the son of their father. But in these healing spells, we often have it as so-and-so, the daughter or son of that mother. Of course, it's interesting that the matrilineal link is noted in these healing spells. And of course, this idea actually survives into modern Judaism, where the prayer for healing, Mishab Berach, actually typically mentions the mother of the person rather than the father. So this may actually be a survival, at least into modern Judaism, of this kind of matrilineal descent in protective magic. Of course, this spell also abounds in motifs found in other forms of ancient magic. Here we have the Sator word square, which is thought to have magical powers. And we see this word square, of course, written all over the ancient Roman world. What's also interesting, of course, is we have a wide variety of what are called powerful words or magical words 
that are repeated here all along with various Christian symbols. Of course, some of these words we can decipher, in fact, some of them there are actually slightly garbled versions of the so-called four living creatures that are found in the book of Ezekiel, which go on to become symbolic of the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we have those images being invoked in the spell, along with a clear invocation of Jesus. Again, this spell isn't terribly complicated, but what it does show is a wide variety of Christian imagery and Christian motifs being used alongside of more typical magical motifs like the Sator word square being incorporated into a unified kind of Christian magic, which again is helping to heal this person. Of course, love magic or erotic binding magic was just as common in the ancient world as it is in the modern world. Uh, and notice I call it erotic binding magic because it's not really love that we're dealing with here. If you're being magically compelled to love someone or to have sex with them, you don't exactly have consent. And so you really, you're erotically bound to that person rather than in love with them. So I make a distinction here between love magic and what I would rather call erotic binding magic. Of course, a great deal of erotic binding magic survives from antiquity, and this spell is interesting because it attempts to bind one man, a guy named Papalo, to another man, a guy named Fello. Now, Fello, it seems, uh, may be actually a word for an elder or perhaps even another monk. Of course, this spell is interesting because while we don't have a great deal of same-gendered love magic, from the ancient world, although I did mention one of those spells in my other episode on the Greek magic papyri, this one's interesting because it's not just same gendered love magic, but it actually might be same gendered love magic between two monks. Now again, I know what some of you may be thinking. Magic alone is not allowed in Christianity and there's no such thing as Christian magic. Well, of course, many Christians practice magic as this entire episode's about. You might also be saying something like, well, Christians aren't supposed to be gay. Well, Sorry, they are. There are lots of gay Christians. And so unsurprisingly, in the ancient world, we're going to have erotic bonding magic between men and perhaps here even between monks. Sorry, not sorry. History just is what it is. This magical spell is rather complicated. And unsurprisingly, if it were written by a monk, of course, monks are going to have access to a much higher degree of literacy and therefore perhaps a much higher degree of literacy in magical techniques. So we here have a great deal of magical words. The word rus is being used over and over again, although exactly what this word is meant to mean is unclear. But we also have the invocation of the typical name of God used in these texts, al sabaot, the idea of God of the hosts, which is a classic name for God in Israelite and Hebrew scriptures, along with the ubiquitous ring characters that we see all through Greek magical practice. These ring characters are a bit mysterious, and I've actually done an entire episode on their history and development. But clearly these ring elements in this spell are meant to further enhance its magical power. So again, this spell actually betrays a lot of what we know about Greco-Egyptian magical practices, although it's clearly being used here very likely by a monk in order to entice another monk to have sex with him. Uh, and it's very clear, right, that this is sexual. The language here is very clearly erotic. So again, an interesting spell because it shows a range of magical practices from this period, and also, of course, interesting because it is a same gender erotic binding spell, which are pretty rare in the ancient world. So worth investigating, worth looking at these spells more closely, because again, they reveal that the ancient world was, well, a lot like our world. Unsurprisingly, as much as people seek love in the ancient world, they also seek to curse people they hate. And so we also have a wide variety of curse spells to be found in early Christian magic. So some of the more interesting and, well, macabre spells that we actually have in early Christian magic are those written on bones, sometimes camel bones. But as we'll see, one of these spells is actually even written on a human rib, and we have some reason to believe that some of these spells would have been written in blood on those bones. Of course, mummies and corpses have long held the idea in ancient Egypt of having supernatural powers, the idea that they have somehow survived death, a common idea in ancient Egyptian religion. So it's not surprising that curses, the idea that you would send evil to someone or send death to someone, is going to be associated with blood and bones and actually burying those bones with written curses on them with the corpses of people. 
So here we're going to turn to some curses and we're going to see that the use of bones, uh, human bones in fact, was not at least super uncommon in ancient Christian magic. So here's a curse spell actually written on a human rib bone. Now again, where they got a human rib bone is mysterious and weird, but the actual spell here is meant to curse someone called Apollo. Now Apollo was just a typical Greek name. Lots of people were named Apollo, including Christians. And what's interesting about this spell is that it's supposed to rain down all kinds of curses, perhaps in the form of uh, an angry ghost, which is something we also see in Egyptian mythology. But here you'll notice that one of the curses is that they will be bombarded or cursed like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Of course, a clear reference to the two famous destroyed cities in the Hebrew Bible, thus linking this Egyptian magic perhaps with a more biblical story that a Christian or perhaps a Jew would have known. Also, it's worth noticing here that we actually know the person who wrote this spell out. We have a certain Jacob of Euphemia, and the fact that we know his name was Jacob further tells us that either this person was a Christian or a Jew. So again, we have magic being written out on a bone, probably placed with a corpse, meant to somehow summon perhaps that corpse into the form of an angry ghost to curse the person that Jacob here really just doesn't like. So don't cross Jacob of Euphemia. This other spell is a bit more vague, but it also is prescribed to have been written on a bone. Now we don't have the actual version written on a bone, we simply have the spell that tells us that in order to be effective it must be written on a bone and placed with a corpse. What this spell does is again somewhat vague, but it seems like it might be a kind of necromancy that attempts to revivify the dead, a common motif of course in ancient Egyptian mythology. There's a relatively obscure reference here to a child with flowing hair. We're not quite sure exactly what this is meant to represent but I suspect that this spell is probably meant to revivify a dead child. Of course, child death in the ancient Egyptian world or the ancient world more generally is very common, and so it's not surprising that a desperate parent would turn to a kind of necromancy in the hopes of their child somehow either surviving death or actually being physically resurrected through a kind of magic. So as someone who recently had a child and who also has a young two-year-old, this piece of magic is especially touching and sad and powerful. I think a cross-cultural idea we can all grasp, Christian or otherwise, is that grief drives people to do rather extreme things, and there's probably perhaps very few forms of grief more extreme than the loss of a child. So unsurprisingly, we may have a spell here which is attempting to revivify a dead child in the form of a kind of necromancy written on a bone and perhaps placed with that very corpse. So again, a very sad and touching form of magic, but again, a form of magic which cuts through barriers like Christian or Jewish or pagan and tells us what we're dealing with are people, and perhaps people, in profound grief. Again, some of these spells border a bit on the humorous. Here we have a 4th or 5th century spell written in Coptic where a certain Mary is cursing a certain Martha. Uh, and it seems like, we, again, we don't know what Martha did, but Mary's curse is very extreme, where she invokes the power of Jesus to ruin Martha's marriage and fill her full of ulcerous tumors and all kinds of things. Uh, again, I don't know what Martha did, but damn, like, be careful not to cross Mary here with her curses. So again, what's interesting to me about these spells is not often how complicated they are or how weird they are or how the magic is meant to do X, Y, or Z. This just gives us a glimpse into the life of common everyday people where apparently Mary and Martha had some kind of feud and Mary decided that rather than going about the regular way of disliking her, she decides to in fact invoke Jesus himself to curse her and ruin her marriage, etc. So again, just a glimpse into the human life of people using early Christian magic as a way of cursing people. Now again, would the average Christian bishop say this was a good idea? Of course they wouldn't. But does that matter to average Christian people who are obviously in a tiff with one another? No. So again, what's interesting about this spell, brief as it is, is that the glimpse it gives us into the life of common people. This is just one more curse spell, and again, I don't want to put too much emphasis on the curse spells. There's a lot of protective spells as well. Uh, the curse spells, for whatever reason, are just far more complex, and they just have a lot more interesting features to talk about. 
Uh, this curse spell is really fascinating because of the imagery that is meant to be carved onto a piece of metal and actually smeared with various kinds of oils, in fact smeared with menstrual blood, in order to accomplish the various curse that is supposed to be carried out by this magic. So here we have images of what appear to be bound entities, perhaps bound angels or demons that are meant to do the cursing, or perhaps even person that is meant to be cursed being bound in a magical way with these very elaborate ring-shaped magical devices. These ring-shaped devices, as you may know from other episodes that I've done about magic in the ancient world, are ubiquitous in this period, and in fact that ringed magical symbol appears through later Islamic and Jewish magic and appears all the way into modern contemporary pagan practices to this day. You can actually see these exact same ringed figures in various magical alphabets in various contemporary magical texts. Of course, the spell is also interesting because it uses waxen dolls or waxen effigies as a mechanism of cursing the persons involved with the spell. Uh, the use of these kinds of dolls as a form of magical practice have actually been recovered from the ancient world, and so we know a little bit about how these dolls were used. What's again also interesting is these dolls were sort of buried or they were smeared with various kinds of things. In this case, we actually have the doll being wrapped in mummy wrappings uh, and then smeared with various kinds of oils and menstrual blood in order to affect the curse. And then the dolls were buried in some kind of way in order to affect that curse. So again, a very complicated curse ritual, which again gives a glimpse into the wide range of imagery and motifs that have actually survived well into medieval and in contemporary magic. So it's interesting that the kind of magic operating here in this early Christian period uh, is being inherited from earlier forms of magic and survives well into the contemporary period. This last spell that I want to discuss is perhaps one of the most interesting and unusual to me in the entire collection. Like, yeah, even more interesting than the weird bone ones. This spell invokes a wide variety of archangels. It seems to even invoke the power of King David, which will matter more in just a moment. In fact, this spell even seems to invoke the power of the Zodiac. Well, to what end? A good singing voice. The person wants to sing well and entice other people with their singing voice. In fact, the spell even reads that the operator of this kind of magic wants to be such a good singer that people demand an encore and in fact close their shops to come listen to this guy sing. Interestingly, we even know the name of the person who invoked this magic. He was a certain Cerverus of Anna. Now, I've never heard of Cerverus of Anna. Maybe his spell really worked and he was the rage of the ancient world. But what's interesting here is that we have a wide variety of magical techniques and devices being used to try to get this guy to sing well. One of the more interesting aspects of this spell is that part of what it invokes are the seven holy vowels. These are the seven vowels of the Greek alphabet, which are said to be tattooed across the chest of the Father Almighty. Yeah, that Father Almighty, like Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things seen and unseen, like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that guy. So the idea is that apparently the Father Almighty has a chest piece uh, tattooed across his chest with all these vowels, and part of how this spell is supposed to work is by invoking the power of those vowels. Now we see the use of those vowels in various kinds of permutations all through magic, both Christian and otherwise, in the ancient world. And the use of these vowels may have been something like a chant or a kind of hymn or a kind of drone meant to induce a kind of meditative or magical state. We really just don't know exactly how these vowels are being used, although we see them in everything from magical texts to Gnostic Gospels. But clearly the idea, at least in this text, is that they are actually tattooed across the chest of God and one can invoke them or sing them or chant them somehow and that leads further power to the incantation itself. This idea of the vowels being tattooed on the chest only occurs in a very few other magical texts, both of them Christian for whatever reason. So just why these vowels being tattooed on the chest of God seems to be uh, either uniquely Christian or at least found only in Christian magic is unclear, but this is just such an evocative image that I couldn't pass it up. Further, what's also interesting about this spell is that we're given some insight into the media and the material culture of just how this spell is meant to be carried out. We're actually told that you have to write it out in with certain kinds of substances. 
We see this in various other forms of magic, but the fact that we actually have very detailed descriptions of what's going on here is fascinating. Further, we also have this very elaborate ring imagery, which again, we've seen in other magical texts as well. And we see again, spread all throughout ancient magic and all the way through medieval and contemporary magic. But notice it's interesting about this ring magical imagery here is that the scribe of the spell is actually depicted what might be Cerberus, the son of Anna, actually depicted here with a kind of lute or a kind of guitar. I'm not sure what the exact name for this ancient instrument would be, but notice this may actually be a picture of the uh, person invoking this magic in their future state as a kind of magically empowered singer. Or it could be an image of the divine King David who the spell also invokes. Of course, David also was famous as a musician. So exactly what this spell is meant to do is really clear. It's just to get a good singing voice, which apparently was a big deal as much then as it is now. But we have a wide range of different kinds of imagery and magical techniques being used in this spell. And again, this image of the, of the person holding the guitar is just fascinating because it's the use of the ringlet magical symbols being actually used to compose the image of the singer that I guess the singer wanted to be, or perhaps again, of the kind of angelic King David. Again, this spell is just so interesting because of its complexity, the aim of the spell, and the general tenor of the spell that I just couldn't pass it up. So again, here we have a spell for a good singing voice, which again gives a gamut of this kind of magic. We have curses, we have perhaps revivification spells for children, and we have things as basic as healing spells. And then here we have a somewhat interesting, I think a rather interesting spell for the invocation of a good singing voice here in early Christian magic. Of course, this is just a small sample of the over 150 spells that have survived from this period of early Christian magic. And I'm not gonna be able to do justice to the full range of those spells here. Although I will point out that because we have over 150 spells that have survived, this is probably indicative of the fact that we're probably thousands, probably tens of thousands of spells that were generated in the ancient Christian context, which only serves to prove that magic was alive and well in ancient Christianity. Of course, Christians never stopped practicing magic, even after this Egyptian period, and Christian magic survives both into the Byzantine context but also, of course, into Europe. In fact, one might even say that all of medieval magic is in some sense Christian magic, of course, with the exception of Jewish magic. And we're gonna spend a good bit of time here on the channel discussing the development of specifically Christian magic. So if you're interested in that topic, make sure to stick around. Further, if you're interested in the history of magic, alchemy, the occult, hermetic philosophy, or Kabbalah, make sure to subscribe to our channel these are all core content issues, and we explore them almost every week here at Esoterica. If you want to support my work of making scholarly, accessible, and free content on topics in Western esotericism, please consider supporting my work on Patreon or with a one-time donation. Your support of Esoterica really does make this channel possible, from all the books I have to buy to do research, to the time it takes to produce these videos, your support really does make this channel and its content possible. Esoterica is a growing project, starting here with YouTube content. We're going to eventually grow to a winter seminar and eventually semester-length classes, interviews, and more. So your continued support of Esoterica makes content in Western Esotericism free and accessible. So again, please consider supporting our work via Patreon or with a one-time donation. Of course, if you really want to deep dive into ancient Christian magic, then the primary text you're going to want to pick up is a text by that name, Ancient Christian Magic, that's edited by Meyer and Smith. This is a really wonderful collection of over 150 different ancient Christian texts spanning from Coptic to Greek, spanning over the course of several centuries, from some of the earlier centuries of Christianity all the way into what we might call the early medieval period. This is a really wonderful text. Every single spell or collection of spells has a unique introduction for every single spell, a little bit of background and information about the spell, it also has some bibliographic data about where the spell is located, in what museum or collection it's found in, who the principal editor is, etc. So every single spell in the text gets a lot of attention, which is really, really nice, especially if you don't have a lot of background in ancient Christianity or in ancient Egyptian magic. So again, a really wonderful text in almost every regard, almost every regard.
My only complaint about the text is that in the case of many of the magical symbols and many of the magical words, these are those little ringlet symbols that appear throughout Greco-Egyptian magic, but also in ancient Christian magic, in many cases, the signs are simply left out of the text. It'll simply have a bracket and say magical signs here or ring signs are here. It's unfortunate that in many cases, the actual magical symbols are not reproduced. Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. In my general opinion, magic should be taken in its totality and really understanding the text is not just having a translation from Greek or Coptic into English, but actually knowing what it was written on, noting exactly what kind of symbols were being used so that we can really have a better understanding of exactly what this magic looked like in its original context. With that exception, I'll say that this text by Meyer and Smith is really a wonderful addition to anyone who wants to study ancient magic, ancient Christianity, or the overlap between those two, or even just the history of magic in general. Again, we can't really understand the development of magic, especially into the medieval and the modern period, without understanding the cradle of Western magic, which is in some sense the Greco-Egyptian context. Of course, if you're really interested in Greco-Egyptian magic, the text you'll need to pick up is the Greek Magic Papyri by Betts. As I mentioned earlier in this episode, I've done an entire episode just on that topic with some recommendations for Greek magic, Egyptian magic, and the synthesis that we have in the Greek Magical Papyri. So if you've studied some Greek Magical Papyri, but you've not taken a look at the specifically Christian texts, then the Meyer and Smith text is an absolutely important adjunct to the vast library that is the Greek Magical Papyri, because you really can't understand the Greek Magical Papyri without seeing that Christianity was a huge component of that world. So I hope you found our introduction to some ancient Christian magical texts interesting to really reveal that Christianity is a far more complex and nuanced religion than simply the high level debates among scholars and theologians about whether the nature of Christ is the same nature of the father of its homo usios or homo oisios. Of course, those conversations and debates are very interesting, especially to me as a philosopher. But what's also crucially important is knowing that in everyday life, we have these interesting magical practices and these magical texts more than those high level academic debates of the ancient world really shed light onto the actual human lived experience of Christians in this early period of that religion's development. So then rather than shedding an exclusive light on the high level theological and philosophical texts of the ancient world, these magical texts really put a human face on early Christianity. And for that reason alone, I'm really grateful they've survived and I'm really happy to be able to study them to learn more about early Christians and the magic they practiced. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane side of history, philosophy, and religion.